Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Aya Neo. Now I've been really excited about this releasing. I finally got my hands on one and in this video we're going to be doing an unboxing. We're going to go over the specs, run some benchmarks, and we're also going to test out some PC games on this thing. Now if you're in the US, they do have an Indiegogo launching soon and I'll leave a link to the landing page in the description. They were actually kind enough to send over a Founders Edition for review, but I'm not being paid to make this whatsoever. Now one of the big reasons I'm excited about this is because I'm actually a big fan of these Ryzen chips. And this is actually powered by the Ryzen 5 4500U. And as you can see, this thing is absolutely beautiful. We have a 7 inch screen, built in controls, 16 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabyte M.2 NVMe that's replaceable if you ever want to upgrade it down the road. And it runs Windows 10 right out of the box. I'm sure we could install different operating systems on here. But personally, I'm really interested to see how this thing can game on the go. And yeah, I mean, straight out of the box, this thing looks like a premium handheld gaming PC. So inside the box, along with the unit itself, we also get our USB Type-C cable for charging this thing up, plus a 65 watt PD power supply. So this is actually my second time booting this unit up. I still need to do some setup, but this screen looks great. It's a 7-inch IPS coming in at 1280 by 800 and I personally think this is the perfect size for a handheld like this. So taking a look at the bottom, we have dual stereo speakers. We also have a single USB Type-C port here, and this will act as our charger for the battery. Swapping around to the top of the unit here, we have two more USB Type-C ports, a 3.5mm audio jack, power button, and volume control. So as we know, this does have built-in controls, and over here on the left-hand side, we have a single analog stick, a D-pad, a start and select button, very similar to the Xbox button, and the H button actually functions kind of as an Xbox button. It'll bring up your menu inside of Windows. Plus, we have this extra LED button, which activates the accent LEDs that are built into the unit itself. On both sides, behind the controls, we have four RGB LEDs. Over on the right hand side, we have four action buttons, A, B, X, Y, another analog stick, and we have four extra hotkey buttons. So we have a Windows button, Escape, Task Manager, and Keyboard. So it makes it really easy to use this without a physical keyboard or mouse. We also have four triggers up top, and the analog sticks have L3 and R3. So we have all the buttons we need to play basically any game. Around back, there's not much going on, but this is where all the cooling happens. This has a built-in blower fan with a copper heatsink inside of it to keep that CPU nice and cool, even when it's boosting up on all six cores. Because, like I mentioned, this is powered by the Ryzen 5 4500U. And what that gives us is six cores, six threads, base clock of 2.3 GHz with a boost up to 4.0. Built-in Radeon 6 graphics at 1500 MHz. We also have 16 gigabytes of LPDDR4X running at 4,266 megahertz here, a 7 inch 1280 by 800 IPS LCD with five points of multi-touch, 802.11 AX Wi-Fi, so we do have Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0, a 512 gigabyte NVMe SSD. It is user replaceable if you want to pull the back off and replace it, and a 47 watt hour battery. So I've had a few days to spend with this unit, and overall I'm really impressed by this thing. It's got a beautiful screen, the built-in controls are excellent, and performance is absolutely amazing for the form factor. And speaking of performance, I did run some benchmarks, so we're going to go over those first, and then we're going to jump right into some gaming, because after all, that's what this thing was really made for. Now keep in mind, with each one of these benchmarks, the CPU's TDP is around 16 to 17 watts. You can drop this down using third-party applications so you can get better battery life out of it but I really wanted to see what this thing could do, and stock, the TDP is set at about 17 watts. First up, we have Geekbench 5 with a single core of 1088 and a multi of 4260. Keep in mind, we only have six cores and six threads. This doesn't have the extra threads like the higher end Ryzen chips do, but this is looking great for its form factor. The next benchmark I ran was PC Mark 10 with a total score of 4,787. And if we take a look at the bottom here, it's saying that we're better than 48% of all other results on the website. Moving over to 3D Mark, here we have Night Raid with a total score of 11,444. Next up, we have Fire Strike, 2,935. And finally, Time Spy with a 1,097. Now, if you compare this to, let's say, a desktop PC with a higher-end GPU, that's definitely going to score higher. But keep in mind, we're working with a handheld here, and for the form factor and the fact that we can carry this around with us, these scores are looking great. 
Alright, so first up we have Forza Horizon 4, and every one of these games is going to be running at 1280 by 800 because that's the resolution of the built-in screen. On average, I was actually getting around 67 FPS with this game, medium settings, and it looks really good on this screen. By the way, this does have vibration motors built in, and the feedback here is great. I mean, it's definitely super strong. It's way stronger than something like a Switch controller or an Xbox 360 controller. You can definitely feel it in the whole console. Next on the list, we have GTA 5, and I'm really impressed with the performance here. On average, 68 FPS, 1280 by 800, normal medium mix settings here, and this game is definitely playable, as you can see, and these controls feel absolutely amazing. I mean, having this in handheld mode running this well is really awesome, and when it comes down to it, I mean, I'm a big fan of GTA 5. This is probably one of my top three favorite games of all time, and I still play it on the regular. At least once a week, I'll pick this up either on Xbox or PC, and to have this in a handheld form factor like this is pretty awesome. Here's Skyrim, Special Edition, Medium Settings, we're sitting at 60 FPS. I see it drop down to 59 every once in a while, but if that frame counter wasn't on screen, I'd never notice it. This is running really well, and I understand that this is available on Switch, but if you've ever played that port, in my opinion, it's definitely not the greatest. Next on the list, we have Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, medium settings, and I, I kind of just wanted to test out the controller here with some Street Fighter special moves, and either way you go about it, either using the analog stick or the D-pad, you'll be able to pull them off just fine. I actually do like this D-pad, the shape of it is a little odd when you're looking at it, but it feels great and it works fine. Here's Doom Eternal, and it ran way better than I thought it would. Now, I did have to drop this down to low settings with dynamic resolution scaling on, but you can get over 60 FPS out of it. You'll see that FPS counter up in the top right-hand corner jump past 70 every once in a while, but I was getting an average of 62 with it, and even on low settings, this game looks amazing on this screen and plays just fine. Another one I always like to test is CSGO. Now the way I have this set up is I just have a keyboard and mouse plugged in so I can play it properly. And we're getting well over 100 FPS with high medium mix settings here. Here's Fortnite, medium settings with 100% resolution scale. On average, I was getting 77 FPS out of this one. It's definitely playable on this handheld device, and there's a chance we could take a lot of these settings up to high and just lock it at 60 and play it like that. And finally, Crisis Remastered. Now, going into this game, I didn't think we were going to be able to get this kind of frame rate out of it. It's not at 60, and we have a low medium mix sitting here, but it's definitely playable. And I've tested this newer version of Crisis on a lot of different setups. I'm really surprised seeing that we were getting an average of 42 out of this one. Going into this, the main thing I was worried about were CPU temperatures, but they've got that covered. So through all of my tests you saw running in this video, I had core temp running in the background, and that kind of gives me a log of all the CPU temperatures. The highest we reached was 84 degrees Celsius, and that was while we were running Crisis. So we didn't hit thermal throttle, we were at full power on that CPU the whole time we were using this thing. And when it comes to fan noise, this can definitely kick up. It is audible, but if you had headphones on, or if you have the volume up more than halfway on the game you're playing, 
it's really indistinguishable from the game sound. And personally, it doesn't bug me whatsoever. I can't hear it when I have the volume up more than halfway on this thing. It's got a bigger blower fan than some of the other mini handheld PCs, so it's not a whiny fan at all. And when this thing is sitting at idle, the fan is on, but it's inaudible from about a foot away. So like I said, the unit I have in my possession is known as the Founders Edition, so this is basically the first edition to market. They're going to be further optimizing this unit as they go on, and some of the main things they're going to be focusing on is reducing the overall weight of the unit, optimizing settings inside of Windows that comes pre-installed here, specifically tailored for this unit. They're also going to go through and optimize the built-in vibration motors and tweak the screen colors on this thing. So there are a few little things that will change from the Founders Edition to the next. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm a huge fan of this thing. I love the form factor. The screen is beautiful. We got plenty of space there. That 7-inch screen looks absolutely amazing on this thing. The built-in controls are spot on. It's got really nice haptics built in. And as you saw, performance is really great for a handheld device like this. Now, they're claiming up to six hours of battery life, and I could definitely see that with the screen brightness down and some light gaming, light internet browsing and stuff like that. But if you want to run AAA games on this at 17 watts or even higher with a third-party application, then you're not going to be getting six hours. I'm going to be doing some testing. I think we're going to be in the range of around two hours at 15 to 17 watts. And still, that's not bad. Plus, you can charge this from a PD charger or a quick charger. So if you do have, let's say, a 20,000 milliamp hour battery pack that you charge your phone up with, you can plug it right into here and charge the console up on the go. And by the way, I've tested a lot of little mini handheld PCs on my channel, and this is definitely the best performer so far. But I personally haven't gotten my hands on the GPD Win 3. And when I do, we'll have to do a little bit of a comparison. But as it sits right now for what I've tested, this thing is absolutely amazing. So like I mentioned, I will have a few more videos coming up. If there's anything specific you want to see running on this, just let me know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more about this or possibly backing the Indiegogo, I'll leave a link for their website and the Indiegogo launch page in the description. But that's it for this one. And like always, thanks for watching.